folklorists. Peace, everyone. I always begin my saying this is the Don Yoder lecture in religious folk life. Don Yoder is still alive, I'm happy to say. His brain is functioning better than mine. And I believe 87 years of age. And I'm very happy to report that I'm still alive as well. <laughs> Our section meeting for the religious, for the uh, folk belief and religious folk life section is tomorrow at 12 o'clock, I believe. And I know that's in your lovely listing of activities. We want to see everyone there. <laughs> Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this year's lecturer, Don Yoder Lecture in Religious Folk Life. I've known Bill Westerman for many years. I've known him so long that I know his name is H. William Westerman. <laughs> Bill was formerly the director of the Cambodian American Heritage Museum and Gilling Fields Memorial in Chicago and he's worked for many years with immigrant and refugee communities throughout the world. He's currently a, a writing seminar on the writing seminar faculty at Princeton University, where he teaches a course, a seminar on refugees, immigrants, and social justice. Now, at this point, I wanna read something that Bill has on his, on his um, Princeton site. I don't know if I can say xenophobia, but I'll try. William Westerman's broad interests fall into two intertwined areas. His main focus is currently human rights of migrants with a special interest in the detention or imprisonment of immigrants and refugees worldwide. He also studies museums, oral history, and community arts. Is that a code word for folklore? No, community arts. I just don't see folklore in this, so I'm looking for it, Bill. <laughs> Strategizing how these can become instruments of civil engagement and social change, particularly in stopping racism, xenophobia, and genocide. Current projects concern the role of culture in refugee camps and settlements, and Afghan and Bangladeshi migration across southern Europe. As I said, I've known Bill since we were both graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania. Of course, as an undergraduate at Harvard University, Bill asked every folklorist, both living and dead, to contribute to a publication he was developing for his senior capstone. Isn't that right, Bill? More or less, yeah. And my greatest memory of Bill, of course, is as a graduate student when we would room together here at the meetings of the American Folklore Society. And Bill would argue with Peter Tukovsky late into the night, and I wouldn't get any sleep. <laughs> Bill, thank you for that. Thank you all for coming, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you the 2009 Don Yoder Lecture, Bill Westerman. Thank you, Leonard, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Leonard and also to Maggie Cruzy for inviting me to give this address. Um, I also would like to thank Diane Goldstein. Um, this paper actually has nothing to do with either of the, any of the specialties that, that Leonard read from my bio. Um, but I wrote this, and I had the idea for this topic um, in response to Diane's paper last year, um, and also in response to some things that Deborah Kodish had said to me about interrogating the political dimensions of folk life studies. So this is an ongoing conversation, I hope, with a lot of you. And um, it was Diane's paper last year that inspired me to dialogue back. And I also want to thank Mario Montano for some input into this as well. In 1963, Don Yoder famously wrote in his article, The Folk Life Studies Movement, perhaps a flail can teach us more about man than a Civil War sword. He changed this phrase five years later to perhaps a flail or a plow. 
And though he didn't alter what we would now identify as gender-specific language, he added the, the act of planting to the act of harvesting in the contrast against symbols of war and destruction. The word flail comes from the Latin flagellum, which is also the root of the English word flagellate, with its religious connotations in some sects of Catholicism and Islam. Dr. Yoder may have also made this addition because according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the word flail can also be used, in fact, to refer to a kind of weapon consisting of a spiked ball chained at the end of a stick. And one nickname for this weapon is a holy water sprinkler. While it would, it would, it would be worth asking Dr. Yoder if he intended all the symbolism, his sentence is noteworthy from the perspective of folk life for two reasons. First, he asserts that social history can teach us more than military history or the history of big events. Second, he locates in the artifact a matrix of symbols and meanings, a nexus of aesthetics and use, the mutual impact on each other of craft and practice. But I want to concentrate also on another part of the sentence, which is the verb. A flail can teach us more. The artifact has an active role in our study. It is not just a passive object to be venerated or appreciated for its functionality or its beauty. It can teach us. I don't think I am reading too much into this verbal construction to say that in using the active voice, Dr. Yoder imbued the flail with an epistemological function. He implicitly indicated that the flail, as well as being an object to be appreciated as something artistic, can become the basis of inductive analysis of the larger community, which is to say that if we analyze the multiple meanings, functions, symbolism, creation, and use of the flail, we will start to learn something more about that community. By locating the flail, an object of harvest, at the center of our inquiry, Dr. Yoder also positioned folk life as the study of everyday work and subsistence, not just in this one sentence, but the sentence in this case was representative of a larger sense of scope. By 1999, folklore was cast in a different light. Mary Hufford suggested that the field was concerned with, quote, alternative worlds taking shape in cracks formed by the grid of enlightenment ways. We may stand in the spaces of the grid, but our passion is for what's in the cracks. That the official institutions defined by that grid tend to constitute our disciplinary object as leftovers rather than alternatives makes our position all the more intriguing." End, end of quote. Now somewhere in those 35 years between those two articles, the material of our study shifted conceptually from what was quotidian, farming, food, clothing, craft, architecture, land use, to what was alternative. Even though we are interdisciplinary in our approach, ever since studying under Dr. Yoder, I've been convinced that what we call folk life studies, or folklore and folk life, or simply sometimes just folklore, remains its own discipline. I used to be against the idea of disciplines, seeing them as exclusive means of keeping people out, especially people without the right credentials. And while in some cases they no doubt do protect interests, I also came to appreciate that our discipline, at least, had a distinctive worldview and methodology. I felt this way not just because of the weight of the massive pen chip on my shoulder that many of my cohort feel as our department was degraded, demoted, and disbanded, but even long before then, because in my exposure to other disciplines, I came to realize that they did not think the way that we did, especially about two things that matter a lot to me, aesthetics and politics. As an undergraduate reading the work of Don Yoder and Henry Glassie before I had ever met or studied with them, their writing demonstrated not only the historical and cultural significance of craft items, but moreover made the case that these metal or textile crafts were art, and in so doing, this changed my understanding of aesthetics forever. I think that is probably not an uncommon response among many of you here. I won't be going further into that dimension in my talk tonight. What has taken me longer to appreciate when thinking about what makes folk life distinct as a discipline is that our discipline represents not just a dis distinct aesthetics, but a distinct epistemology. This is what connects the part of folk life studies concerned with manifest practices, such as material culture, foodways, labor, and space, with the part of our studies concerned with belief about religion, spirituality, health, the supernatural, and politics. There was a moment of change in our field when collections of popular beliefs, sometimes pejoratively called superstitions, became something more than just collectania to be cataloged when such beliefs became part of a coherent worldview. 
Just as the work of David Hufford, Diane Goldstein, and others have demonstrated that such a discipline with its own worldview can change the delivery of health care, I have long argued that understanding beliefs about injustice can have an impact in social work and community organizing. I'll return to this later. I maintain, and I think the record of folk life studies in this country and in Europe, if not elsewhere, shows that our field still concerns what is most central to people in their daily lives, and not just the alternatives, even though people may have to turn to alternatives when institutions such as the economy and the state provide only unacceptable choices. But my main focus is on investigating what Dr. Yoder usually leaves implicit, understanding the politics of our work, our sense of epistemological validity, and how inductive reasoning plays a part in this. A Princeton University anthropologist by the name of Rena Letterman is currently at work on the study of, an, of the anthropologi anthropology of disciplinarity. <coughs> this is somewhat different from the sociology of knowledge, but is similar, similarly concerned with the organization of knowledge at this meta level. If the sociology of knowledge deals with how disciplines are shaped by socioeconomic forces and political factors, the anthropology of disciplines has more to do with what counts as valid knowledge and methodology in various disciplines. Letterman argues that disciplines are not defined merely by subject matter nor by approach. But she writes, and I quote, I am interested in a number of suggestive boundary problems between anthropology and its neighbors made evident if we consider their respective ethical presuppositions, their respective senses of proper or improper research practices. My thesis is that whatever else they are, disciplines are moral orders. Disciplines constitute themselves in implicit and explicit dialogue or contest with one another, not simply as substantively distinctive, but also as better or worse, even proper or improper, that is, morally weighted knowledges. Even proper or improper, that is, morally weighted knowledges. As much as I find, end of quote, as much as I find this analysis highly insightful, like many anthropologists, and perhaps I'm proving her claim here, in her discussion of different disciplines, she ignores the very existence of Anthro's closest sister discipline, whether we call it folklore or folk life. But while I take her to task for that, it gives us an opportunity to examine her claim in light of the difference between the two disciplines. It's not that we can't study the same material. It's not that we can't both use the ethnographic method. And it's not that we have to make different geographical decisions when it comes to our subject. In all these three areas, we overlap. But folklorists, I contend, maintain a moral order and a sense of ethical presuppositions that are distinct from anthropologies, even as we may coexist on a professional level, work together, and speak the same language. The anthropologist Peggy Sande has argued that it was the work of Franz Boas, Ruth Benedict, and Margaret Mead that developed a paradigm of inductive investigation in anthropological fieldwork, as the field shifted from a science that classified into one that collected, while trying to build interpretations of culture from its evidentiary parts. Sande argues that Clifford Geertz, in his thick description of cultural experiences as a basis for interpretation, analysis, and even diagnosis, was continuing in this tradition of inductive inference. In Local Knowledge, Geertz writes, quote, if we are going to cling, as in my opinion we must, to the injunction to see things from the native's point of view, where are we when we can no longer claim some unique form of psychological closeness, a sort of transcultural identification with our subjects? Drawing on Heinz Kohut, Geertz makes the distinction between what he calls experience near and experience distant concepts. The experience near concept refers to how people might describe experiences to others close enough to them to understand exactly what they are feeling or undergoing. An experience distant concept, Geertz writes, quote, is that specialists of one sort or another, an analyst, an experimenter, an ethnographer, even a priest or an ideologist, employed to forward their scientific, philosophical, or practical aims. To Geertz, anthropological work is experience distant because it is transcultural and because the ethnographer is a specialist within his or her aims. Because the early folk life studies movement in Europe developed through the study of members of different social classes within the same culture, the whole question of the transcultural has been a different one for folklorists. Furthermore, the adoption of a different aesthetic having seen through the native's point of view is another practical difference in our approach to the work that anthropologists carry out. Think of the difference in this case between Geertz and Barry Tolkien, for example, when it comes to seeing through the native's point of view. 
I suggest that this is one place in our intellectual history where folk life scholars specifically, and perhaps also folklorists who do not consider themselves concerned with folk life, branched off from anthropologists, though we share the common ancestors such as Boaz. Yoder's work, among others in the folk life studies movement in Europe, allowed people to document and maintain their own expressions of culture, including work culture, land use, and farming, and the arts of everyday life. Much of the entire body of work of Don Yoder's career grew out of studying his own culture, and the tools he developed, such as most strikingly the 50 folk cultural questionnaires published on the back page of Pennsylvania Folk Life, were not the tools of the anthropologist. The work of the belief scholars growing out of folk life was less purely interpretive in the Geertzian mode of analyzing culture and more applied in response to the question, how is what these people are telling me going to, going to, be able, going to enable me to benefit them and others? For me, this moment occurred at that pivotal period, this moment of branching apart, occurred at that pivotal, pivotal period in the early 1970s when the double and intertwined paradigms of applied folklore and public folklore reached their apex and Geertzian interpretation and performance theory became more dominant paradigms in academic specialist attention to culture. While the folk life studies movement was well underway in Europe in the early 1960s, by the time Don Yoder wrote his seminal articles, it was building in this country during the later 1960s and 70s, culminating perhaps in the American Folk Life Preservation Act. In other words, it was at this time that the influence of Don Yoder on younger scholars like Henry Glassie and David Hufford and the development of folk life work outside of universities and museums and state agencies, that we as a field institutionalized the moral order and set of ethical presuppositions that Letterman speaks of. The argument can be made that this moral order, this set of ethics and disciplinary morality, can be traced back to the work of Botkin in the 1930s, while Boaz was still alive and active, even though it was not part of our central disciplinary practice. I would actually take this lineage back decades further and suggests that the work of African-American abolitionist William Still, managing the logistics of the Underground Railroad and interviewing people as they escaped from slavery, was the pivotal project of a native scholar who was, as, who was as experienced near as one could get. I've talked about this in reverse chronological order just now, but let me invert this to make my point more clearly. We can draw a line from William Still and Frederick Douglass to the collection and recording of narratives of formerly enslaved African Americans, first taking place at Fisk University and later at the Library of Congress, to the development of a field of folklore and folk life in America with an applied component that resulted in the American Folk Life Preservation Act, as well as the creation of folk arts programs in nearly all US state governments and many nonprofit agencies. This has all been, to use the Kohut and Geertz term, experience near. Even though carried out largely by specialists, because much of the work was based on the epistemological supposition that the knowledge people have about their own way of life, and specifically the understanding that people who were enslaved in this country had of their own experience at a time when historians did not hold this view, is in some strong sense valid. In other words, in other words it is the person who makes the flail and wields it who knows more about it than the specialist does. This was underscored to me by the title of one of the most famous folk life studies monographs to come out of the UK, George Ewart Evans, Ask the Fellows Who Cut the Hay. The title says it all when pointing to who holds the authority for the knowledge. Some of you may already know this, but for years I've been trying to figure out what makes folk life distinct and to answer the question, what do we lose or what does the world of knowledge lose when the discipline and methodology of folk life studies, residual as it may be, is lost. Now, as an AFS executive board member, I know that rumors of the pending demise of our discipline, despite the loss of valuable programs, are premature. And in fact, student membership, I just learned, is at a 10-year high, which bodes well for the future. I am interested in this question not as an academic exercise, but because intellectually I'm concerned with issues of advocacy, community organizing, and the concept of cultural work, which still remains a weakly defined phrase used in a variety of all too haphazard ways. I am concerned with the larger question of how we can develop a social science and practice which is about the delivery or creation of justice and the accessibility of the arts. As a footnote, we also know from reading between the lines and personal conversations, as well as his conversion to Quakerism, that Don Yoder has also been concerned with issues of social justice. 
given all that, in my 1995 dissertation, I looked for the connection between folk life as a disciplinary paradigm and political folk belief, building on the work of David Hufford on medical and supernatural belief. As part of my literature review on the first chapter, I tried to identify the fundamentals of a discipline of folk life studies, per se, that made it distinct from other fields. I came up with a list of 14 fundamentals. In the interest of time and keeping everyone awake, I'm going to whip through them in one very long sentence right now. <laughs> but I, I want you to hear what I leave out. That's the, that's the point. They were concern with everyday life and social reality, focus on the past as well as the present, qualitative research, ethnography and fieldwork at the center of what we do, outlets to the public sector, museums, libraries, and archives, and the potential for application, attention to social class, concentration on the rural, connection between the region being studied and the researcher, romanticization, especially of peasant life, a preference for survivals over emergent traditions, resistance to studying destruction and decay, functionalist approaches, accessibility of our scholarly work, and the authority and collaboration of those being studied. In the intervening 14 years, I now notice what I left out. I, that I under, or at least underemphasized two of the most important philosophically and ultimately political features, philosophical and ultimately political features. I did not mention explicitly the inductive approach of fieldwork and our knowledge making, and I did not frame the expertise of those being studies as an epistemological issue. In the remaining time tonight, I'm going to talk about these two factors, not just to correct my own work, but because I have now come to realize that this is what makes our field unique, radical, and political in ways we might not always think of. We all know what induction is, although it is defined by its most familiar and respected opposite, deduction. Deductive reasoning is based on the logical argument that if the premises are shown to be true, the conclusion cannot be false. In other words, if statement A is true and statement B is true, then conclusion C must follow. Inductive reasoning is more complicated and less certain. According to one logician, William Gustafson, an argument, quote, an argument is inductively strong if and only if, first it is invalid, meaning that there is some flaw in the argument that C follows directly from A and B as described above, but second, that the evidence supplied by its premises makes it highly improbable that its conclusion is false when all the premises are true. In other words, invalid infer inferences, true premises guarantee a true conclusion, but in inductively strong ones, true premises make it highly probable that the conclusion is true by virtue of the strength of the evidence they contain. Gustafson then continues, validity is an all or nothing affair. Inductive strength, however, is a matter of degree according to how much evidence is provided by the premises and therefore how probable the conclusion is. Qualitative researchers would add that it is not only the quantity of evidence, though, but what kind of evidence is introduced, as well as the strength of that evidence, as can be measured by such things as independent corroboration. As our own scholars, such as David Hufford and Bonnie O'Connor, have shown, much of what people consider to be evidence concerning their own bodies and emotions is easily discredited by so-called specialists following a more deductive path. We as folklorists become concerned when native knowledge or personal experience challenges what is considered to be a valid premise because the proponent of that premise is considered to be an authority, such as a doctor or scientist. This then becomes political not just because of the assumed authority of the specialist, usually of a different social class and sometimes gender, racial, or educational background, but because of the accumulated power people in that position may be afforded by the state or by their title. There is even a hierarchy within the sociology of knowledge, or it could be called the sociology of logic, I guess. Philosopher Margaret Bowden points out that in academia, quote, induction carries overtones of the loose, the shoddy, and the impure, if not the positively indecent. Even those who defend induction clearly regard it as the poor man's deduction. If induction is to be invited into the logician's parlor at all, it must be strictly chaperoned by formal measures of confirmability. As folklorists, we know whose confirmability, whose phenomenology is discounted in this society, just as it always has been, including especially people of lower social classes or working class backgrounds, women, people of color, as well as those who are ill, those with disabilities, those who've had supernatural experiences, those caught up in the criminal justice system, immigrants and refugees, and those who are creative or artistic in any way other than through academic schooling and training. However, inductive reasoning is political in other senses, too. In social change work, especially in the area of development, 
deductive approaches often fail because they are developed outside the local context. They assume the expertise of specialists and they take a top-down approach. Local people whose lives are at stake and who usually have grown up in the milieu in which they are still living can take an, take an approach based on experience and reason. David Bornstein, who's written an important book on the development of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, gives three reasons why inductive reasoning is more effective in this kind of work. First, outside groups who see themselves as agents of social change rely on deductive reasoning because they are coming from outside and are staffed by highly paid, self-described experts, not by natives. Second, the directional flow of information varies, with deductive analysis moving from the general to the particular and the inductive moving from the particular to the general, thus giving more weight to local observation and knowledge. As Bornstein says, deduction begins with theories, induction begins with observations. Third, because nothing can be proved through induction, it is constantly open to self-criticism, revision, and adjustment, all of which are necessary in large-scale projects and long-term projects for social change, as mistakes are noted and corrected, but also as social condition conditions change over time. A third realm where induction becomes political and gendered is in the execution of political rhetoric, as analyzed by a number of feminist scholars of language and rhetoric. In an interesting study of the speeches of the, of the late Texas Governor Ann Richards, Bonnie Dow and Mar Mary Bourton, drawing on work by Kay Campbell, note that women's political rhetoric typically, quote, displays a personal tone, uses personal experience, anecdotes, and examples as evidence, exhibits inductive structure, emphasizes audience participation, and encourages identification between speaker and audience. Now, I think we have to be careful about gendered descriptions like this. For example, all of what these above statements are equally true of the rhetoric of anti-immigrant on-air radio personalities. But Dow and Tan argue that women's political rhetoric is more likely to include inductive reasoning than men's. The reasons they suggest why are fascinating. They observe that women's primary social rules have not changed that much over time, and that, quote, women still learn the crafts of housewifery and motherhood. Few women may still make soap or weave cloth. Nonetheless, the traditionary female crafts of emotional support, nurturance, empathy, and concrete reasoning are still familiar requirements of the female role. Men's communica communicative roles are abstract, hierarchical, dominating, while women's are concrete, participatory, cooperative. I was fascinated that this analysis tied women's political speech back to skills learned in the practice of craft. On the other hand, as a folklorist, I know that there are men's crafts as well as women's, and that the process of apprenticeship and skill building knows no gender. So while I am suspicious of saying female is to male as inductive is to deductive, I do find the link they point out between inductive thought and rhetoric and the development of craft technique to be a valid one. The metalsmith who made Dr. Yoder's flail may have been male, but that doesn't make the educational and creative process any less inductive. At Eli as Eliot Eisner beautifully points out in his book, The Enlightened Eye, quote, qualitative inquiry is not only directed towards those aspects of the world out there, it is also directed to objects and events that we are able to create. It is the study of the flail, the craft as product, as process, and as community where we can, see that the ways, we can see the ways that inductive reasoning is occasionally superior to deductive, both in the practice of craft and in the scholarship and analysis of that. But you will note, if you've been paying attention, that I've gotten away from induction as a form of logic. Here I was faced with an interesting conundrum as I carried out my research in the library. When I looked for books on inductive reasoning, the library catalog took me to the logic section of the philosophy shelves. But the books that seemed relevant to this study and that caught my eye were on the epistemology shelves. This indicated something to me, something that began to highlight how we folklorists are radical. And that is this, that folklorists treat induction not as a form of logic, but as a form of epistemology. It is in the evidence gathering, the listening, and the sifting that we come to know what we know. And perhaps no surprise here, this is exactly how folklore works in the world as well. We as people deal every day with premises that we cannot validate, so we operate on what evidence we can and look for other means of verifiability, 
even as we pass along communications that we are not always certain about their truth. We as folklorists are concerned with belief and look at how people make decisions about how they know what they know based not on provable premises, but on factors involving observation and evidence. And as social scientists, we are more likely to cast our lot with those postmodernists who consider that some epistemic notions are privileged over others because of reasons of class and other social hierarchies than we are with those philosophers who deny that there exists epistemic privilege that makes some ideas more likely to be believed or put into practice by others. We are generally less interested in questions of epistemology for purely philosophical reasons and more interested because of what they tell us about communities and the expressive and artistic communications within them, including what they tell us about the distribution of justice and resources and beliefs about the same. But what is it that makes folklorists different, not only from philosophers and postmodern literary theorists, but also from anthropologists? Where do we see our practice as more ethical or simply better, to use Letterman's term, than these others? To answer this, I want to bring in the work of legal scholar Mary J. Matsuda, one of the leaders of an intellectual school known as critical race theory. Matsuda argues for a two-pronged theory of justice, one that involves what she calls radical pluralism, which she defines as a belief that, quote, groups and individuals as members of groups are free to live in and express their culture, including their language, their religion, and their style of living. There is no norm in any of these things that a democratic nation can legitimately impose, and the right to cultural difference must spread to the full range of culture chosen and defined by the group, not by any dominant culture, unquote. This she couples with a principle of anti-subordination, that no culture or community has the right to put down another. In the American context, she writes, this quote suggests a radically pluralistic revisioning of our national identity. The only center, the only glue that makes us a nation is our many-centered cultural heritage. From the Grand Old Opry to Neo Metal, from Zydeco to the Met, we are a range of tastes and sounds wider than ever before known to the nations on this planet. That is the defining centrality of the American culture I grew up in and love, a broad and delightfully incongruous coming together of difference. In acknowledging plural culture as a strength and in recognizing and dismantling the false hierarchies that place one culture over another, it may come to pass that we live together in celebration and peace." Unquote. To be a folklorist, I argue, is to go beyond radical cultural pluralism to radical epistemological pluralism. We may not condone all ways of knowing, especially those that in turn depend on the subordination and humiliation of others, but we recognize the validity on some level of multiple ways of knowing. We have a radically broader sense of truth and evidence than other fields. We get to know these epistemologies not by being the distant specialists, but by being experienced near to the point of empathy. It is in this empathic epistemological pluralism that our broader discipline-wide epistemology develops, one which allows us to move towards an informed position of advocacy for justice, a position that is constantly self-correcting because it is based on deep inductive research and changing knowledge. Even that folkloristic research that is not explicitly oriented towards social justice partakes in this epistemological pluralism because the material of folklore and folk life itself, by definition, is epistemologically fluid. This is what I argue makes us different from all of the other disciplines. A faith in epistemological pluralism combined with a methodology of induction and empathy that even while critically skeptical of its own certitude, compels us to work towards not just truth, but justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. We'd like to um, kind of open up the conversation to everyone who's here. And take some questions. Oh. Uh, 
Okay, two two parts, um, two part answer to that. First of all, it's not better in an abstract sense. It's better. It feels better to us because it fits in with our system of ethics. So, I want to be clear that I'm not saying folklorists are better than anthropologists, but we feel that that where the dis what Letterman is saying is, when we draw the disciplinary boundaries, we set up a territory where we feel what we do on our side of the practice is better than what they do on their side of the practice. I think a lot of anthropologists still are inductive, but I think I detect, and, and certainly what Geertz has written, is that there's this element of stepping back and being the specialist, um, being the analyst, that I don't see to the same, anywhere near the same degree, for example, in Hufford's work or Diane Goldstein's work um, or Bonnie O'Connor's work. And for whatever reason, we maybe it's ideological, but maybe it's also psychological. We have a tendency to want to deny our own expertise or downplay our own expertise as a as a, something that creates a, a bigger boundary between us and the people that we work with, community scholars, artists, and so on. I don't know. I mean, I, I would, if anyone else has answers for that. I would open up the floor too. Phyllis, do you have a question? No, I was just kind of commenting. I mean, I, it's going to take me a little while to digest what, what you said, but I think your views are on point. Um, Thank you. It makes me a little laugh, honestly. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer, but I'm going to write down accountability because I like that. <laughs> was there a question or no, was comment? Yeah. I think I think accountability. Um, and I don't and I don't know. I don't go to AAA, and I don't know enough. I go to the applied answer meetings where there is a sense of accountability, um, but I definitely hear when I go around this meeting or when I talk with other folklorists, we have a very strong sense as a field of accountability that's really part of our ethical practice. That's probably, I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't feel accountable to the people that have, um, that we've worked with. Um, we're paid less, it's harder for us to get jobs. We're paid less and it's hard. I mean, I think it has um, real impact on, on professional practice. Our consulting rates are lower than other fields. I mean, I think it's, and it's, and that's also because I think it's a, a, a very largely feminized discipline. And so unequal wage, um, what's the word, unequal Wage inequity? No, unequal inequity. You know what I mean. The differentials in what men are paid as opposed to what women are paid is, is um, exacerbated here, I think. But is, that's not really, you meant more conceptually, right? What's that? Yeah, I mean, I keep coming back to the our roles, our, our roles 
relative relative to other professionals. Um, I mean, we position ourselves outside of a outside of a political power structure, professional power structure, that takes a real personal toll on us, and then also on our ability to be a source of strength for the communities, or or provide a certain kind of instrumental privilege that communities can use um, with us as a, as a way of achieving their own political power. And also, there's there's a move there, there's movement within the field of epistem within the philosophical subdiscipline of epistemology. There's a fairly recent trend towards what's called social epistemology, where uh, where philosophers are providing social analysis of how epistemology develops, and they're exposing and critiquing some of the biases and and how certain epistemologies are accepted and others aren't. And there are nuances and shades of interpretation in there that I haven't, that's also a next step to get into. Yeah, because at a, at a very base level, we're not just sp uh, scholars of folklore, but we also convey folklore like anybody else does, too. So we're operating on multiple levels. At, we're operating at our own folk level as well as our own professional level. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's an, it's a danger and it's an, it's an appeal, I think, of, of being in that, of being in that situation. Whereas other disciplines would be deeply suspicious of that as somehow invalidating the knowledge or invalidating the experience when in fact there is also this moment of the experiencing the experience as any audience member would. So it's trying to have like a meta, you have to kind of have a meta consciousness about you're in the audience, but you're also observing the performer audience relationship. But that can also get us in trouble with other, with other disciplines, yeah. Empathy. Well, if the difference between sympathy and empathy is that sympathy is feeling for and empathy is feeling with, then no. What's that? Or like. Then 
the nearer that we get, the, the less our understanding becomes an abstracted intellectual understanding and more becomes experiential, experiential and feeling what the person is feeling or, or walking alongside, you know, the... Right. I, w I would agree. But I also think that, I mean, there are certainly people in this room I'm thinking of that have done field work in communities that have really been threatened and endangered, and it's, it's, it's through that empathy that they have then been able to get involved in those struggles, not as an outside observer, but as someone who's affected by the same, by the same struggles. Oh, yeah. But there are people that are also working and doing field work in their own communities right. and their own culture where they have suffered what the, what, But, but we're assuming that, that no one here has been born into that tribe, yeah, no, which is also so, or born into that gender or born into that yes. class. So there are, there are points of connection. But I hear, I hear what you're saying. Wow, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not unidirectional. It doesn't necessarily always have to go towards empathy. Um, if the inductive process is going to be self-adjusting or if there's going to be critical adjusting going on, um, I mean, I, I, raised, I tried to raise the question at the end of what have you become aware of ways of thinking or ways of acting that are repugnant to you. I mean, we had a discussion at breakfast this morning about female genital mutilation as kind of the prototypical example of this. If you're working in a community and the, the women that you're working with are trying to practice this with their own daughters. So in that case, what do you? But we do it in families all the time, I think. I mean, that's getting really close, but you know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like if it's possible in a family to empathize and yet be critical, then... I don't know, this is steps in a process.
I don't know. I mean, Botkin would have said, let's bring the groups together. Let's listen to what the different points of view are and have gatherings where people can sit down and have these dialogues in a safe, relatively safe environment. Um, we have a role as educators, too. We're not just professional. I'm, I, only use, I think I only used the word empathy once. We're not just professionally empathetic. We're also educators. And so we have a role to uh, inform people and be cultural translators. Um, to the extent that that's welcomed by the by the people that we're working with or studying, um, and listen to. I mean, in the case of Afghans, no group is monolithic, right? And there are there are many Afghans that are as against the tribalism and the ethnic separatism, uh, if not more than than there are that are separatist or see those divisions. So, and the, and the same thing, we don't have to look at Afghanistan, I mean, look at the tribalism that's taking place here around, or how the immigration debate and um, the idea of a more welcoming nation is being uh, challenged by the specter of tribalism. Um, so there's a, there's a certain degree of demystification and, and challenging, um, writing out speaking out, explaining the difference between having cultural differences that are, as, as Matsuda says, the difference between cultural differences that are different and all pluralist and okay, or differences that are subordinating because one group is dominating another group, or one group has more access to state power than another group. But. You know, in terms of the work that we do as folklorists and applied folklorists and projects that could be developed and funded in nonprofit agencies and in universities, I mean, this is something that we need to put our heads together and think about these issues and how do we, how do we step back and in, in, into the public arena and, and, and act as informed citizens that are bridges and are able to participate in dialogues that a lot of Americans are not or don't have access to. I mean, I kind of like, I'd like to open up the floor to that question because I certainly don't have all the answers to that, but I see people here that have done programs and projects that work in that, towards that direction.
Which is at the same time not to say that there isn't also ethnic cleansing going on in many conflicts. Yes. So these things are coming from, so yeah. Right. says, can the subaltern speak? Folklore says, folklore says, yes, they're doing it all the time. Both the subalterns are speaking all the time. This is what they sound like. Right. So we're good at that. We're good at that. So we don't have to give the subaltern a voice. The subaltern already has a voice, using the voice right. very artistically, very eloquently. So we, we, come, we come in as translators, amplifiers, and so forth. Okay. All of that is, is, is another way of saying what you've been saying. But then once we stop, once we made the translation, you, Bill, you want to be an advocate. That's a different rhetoric. You want to speak in your own voice on behalf of the people whose voices you have, you have amplified. Is that, is that not true? Isn't there another kind of discourse that, that comes in? Sure, I don't know where you're going with that, though. But <laughs> I'm just, I, I guess I'm translating what I think I've been hearing you say into uh, words, uh, into uh, the verbal instead of the, the feeling level. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, what is the next step? What is the next step verbally? And I think the, I, the, the point that you raise is, I mean, I never, I always, I, I don't know if correct people, but I, I never use the expression, and, and you hear this in a lot of activist groups, we give voice to the people that don't have a voice. I never use that. Um, people have, you know, like you said, people have a voice. So then the next step is, all right, what do we do as a, as a group of individuals concerned with these kind of issues? And negotiating the question of advocacy in the academy and outside the academy. And how do we write, and how do we speak, and for whom? And that's where I think the challenge of the next 10 years is going to, I mean, at least the next 10 years. Yeah. But I want to open that discussion up. I don't want to prescribe. I want to open that discussion up so that it's participatory. Yeah, I mean, people, people certainly can make up their own minds, but I think as a journalist, you would recognize that there are a lot of stories that are not 
it comes back to what Lee was saying. A lot of stories are being said, but they're not being heard, or they're, or they're being misinterpreted. Or, or refugees in Europe are being sent out to refugee resettlement centers in tiny villages where they don't have any interaction with the press or with the citizens. They're just kind of, it might not even be a detention camp. It might look very nice and be very humane, but they're you know, three hours from the nearest city by train and they can't afford to make the trip all the time, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a lot of it is getting those stories out and building, building those kind of dialogue, building the spaces where dialogue can take place. I guess the question I would throw back is, do we have a field here that addresses this problem in a different way from other fields? And that's what I was trying to propose, that we're distinct because we have a particular way of approaching this kind of moral dilemma that's unique and that is marginal. Um, you know, we're not in every university, we're not in every state council, arts council anymore. Um, and so what is, what is it that, that is that, that we have as part of our practice that's not part of a broader practice and can it be, what can we do with that? Thank you.